Hello, I'm Lucy Walker, and this is the third podcast in a short series looking at the subject of tackling difficult subject matter on the operatic stage, specifically the subject of sexual violence. The first podcast, we looked at The Blue Woman, the recent opera by Laura Bowler, which deals with the traumatic aftermath of a sexual assault. And in the second podcast, we did, we discussed the role of the intimacy coordinator and well-being practitioner in looking after the cast and crew when tackling these difficult subjects. Today, this podcast is in two parts. I'm initially joined by Dr. Chris Hilton, Head of Archive and Library here at the Red House. And we're going to look at the background of Britain's 1946 opera, The Rape of Lucretia. And in the second part, I'm going to be joined by Ollie Mears, who is directing a new production of this opera, and by Professor Maria Wyck, who is uh, a professor of classics and is specialises in the subject of gender and sexuality in Greek and Roman times. So first of all, Chris, we're going yeah. to look at the background of Britain's opera, how the subject came about, why he chose mm. to approach this subject, the construction of mm. the libretto, the text, and the casting, and kind of why they did this overall uh, and what effect that has. And I'm, then I'm yeah. going to explore some of the musical aspects of that subject. So. Right. It, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, in some ways, it's easy to forget, I think, because this is such an assured piece, that this is very, very early on in Britain's career. You know, he's, he's written Peter Grimes. Uh, that's been a success the year before. And indeed, there has been Paul Bunyan before that. But nonetheless, one of the reviews of Lu The Rape of Lucretia referred to this as Britain's second opera. Um, they'd completely forgotten about Paul Bunyan, and I think Britain would probably, at that stage in his life, have wanted it that way. So this is early, and this is, in a sense, Britain establishing himself still as a composer. So, so far as we can tell, the choice of the subject matter is, to an extent, driven by er Eric Crozier, uh, producer and director who's a, a member of the Britain Circle at this stage, and Ronald Duncan, the librettist, uh, poet. Um, and Britain is probably, I suppose, influenced by just their saying, here is a serious story from the classical repertoire. It is sanctified by, by being part of the canon. Other uh, writers centuries before have done things with this story. Here are men writing a story about sexual violence against women. Um, plucked from a canon that has been constructed by men over the years. And the thought that this might be a difficult or triggering subject for women in the audience or women in the cast um, doesn't really form part of their thinking at all. It's, it's really quite revealing. That is a really good point. I mean, I, I find in the score that there is definitely a delineation between the male music and the female mm. music and that clash is at the centre of the yeah. violence, but I do, but I think you're right. But in fact, that concern for any triggering is quite recent. Yeah. As, yeah. as we discovered in the last podcast, yeah. it's only really in very yeah. recent years. So yeah. in a sense, you might not blame them for that, but what you might notice about it is how, is how it's treated and how it's constructed. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, this is something that's actually just occurred to me during that last sentence of yours. Um, this is a, an opera that is being staged in England with an English cast, mm -hmm. and it's then taken on tour to Europe. Um, and if you do this in the Netherlands, for example, uh, where they've had an experience of six years of occupation and all that went with that, it's going to be perceived entirely differently by uh, the Dutch women in the audience. And uh, when you then tour it with perhaps a uh, Dutch cast, uh, again, it's going to be a different experience. Uh, an English cast has the luxury of seeing this as things that happened a long, long ago and far away in both time and space. That's yes, that's a really interesting point, and that there is something about the fact that you can, you were allowed to stage more violent mm. uh, events on the operatic stage, the theatrical stage, yeah. if they were kind of framed yes. by historical distance. Yes. Yes, and the frame narrative is doing something there, isn't it? It, it, it is yeah. uh, constructing a safe distance between us and the, uh, the unchained id, if you like. Mm -hmm. the, the, the raw emotion and violence is already framed within the opera and then further framed simply by the fact that this is an opera. It is not a video nasty or a documentary. The, the, the mere fact that it's taking place within a proscenium arch in this uh, genre that favours stylization yeah. in turn takes people away from the... the the impact of what's going on and makes it possible to present it on stage. And the stylization is a good opportunity, the, the word you've used, to, to look at the original staging, which mm. whenever you see it, although they are photographs, obviously, that they had to be still mm. in, it yeah. does look as if it was 
staged as a series of tableau. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating contrast, really, looking at the, the photographs. And, you know, we've got a selection here from the very first production at Glyndebourne in 1946. Um, and as you say, on stage, it's possibly even looking forwards a little bit to, to the no plays later on. There is that embracing of stylization, the Piper set design with its series of arches and people appearing in the... It, it is almost the cast becoming statues. It's as if they're becoming something on the front of the Parthenon. Um, it's a very, very stylized look uh, to it. And then backstage, we have a whole load of photographs taken during the, uh, the putting together of this production. And it, it's fair to say that they seem to have had an absolute blast putting it together. Um, this is, again, I think coming back to that point of this being very early in Britain's career, this is the cast assembling. You know, some of these people have already taken part in Peter Grimes the previous year, but in other cases, this, this is the beginning uh, of an association. Uh, we have, for example, uh, Kathleen Ferrier singing on, on stage with them in a way that was not the case with Peter Grimes. We have Britain operating with a small orchestra, with a chamber orchestra, under his own control, rather than having to work with a big institution like Sadler's Wells. This is you know, his own small repertory company setting off on, on their journey that they'll, they'll be together on for the next few years. It's a, it's a cast of people who are going to work together both on stage and behind the stage. This is, for example, uh, the first time that John Piper works with, uh, with Britain. And again, that's going to be a light motif throughout the, uh, throughout the, the, the next couple of decades. So we have really, on the one hand, this, this stylized uh, tale of sexual violence set centuries in the past, but then behind the scenes, it's a group of friends getting together and in almost, you know, almost that let's do the show right here. There's, there's that feeling of a small troupe making the best of, of the uh, you know, difficult circumstances of 1946 uh, and bonding as a team that will stick together with you know, some changes in personnel over the next 15 years or so. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, because there's these lovely off-duty off shots mm. of Joan Cross knitting and they're playing some game or other. Yes, some, some strange um, variation on quoits. I mean, they seem to be playing <laughs> what looks like volleyball with, with a deck quoit or something, <laughs> Britain and, uh, and Duncan. Britain in a really rather rather fancy sweater, which is you know, not, not a look that we often have uh, associate with him. Um, yes, it's, the, the, it's, there's, there's a lot of fun uh, involved. And also, I suppose, going back to that, uh, that motif of um, a team coming together to overcome difficult circumstances, this is 1946, it's a time of austerity. Um, the first production at Glyndebourne is the only opera that's staged at Glyndebourne that year. And so they have two casts to alternate to save everybody's voices rather than having the one cast absolutely you know, burn through their larynx in the, the course of the, the season. But two casts means two sets of costumes because you know, people are not necessarily the same size. We've got a lovely photo of the two uh, Lucretias, Nancy Evans and Kathleen Ferrier, being fitted for their dresses. That apparently burnt through hundreds of clothing coupons uh, just trying to assemble uh, the textiles for those, those costumes. Uh, it's a time where you're doing things on a shoestring, and there must have been a lot of fun involved in doing that for all of the, you know, the, the difficult subject matter. Indeed. You've also got an item from the, um, the collection which was put together by Kathleen Ferrier uh, um, from a later tour, was it? it? it it's, this came to us from Nancy Evans, in right. fact. Um, and um, we, it's an extremely fragile uh, prop that was used uh, when they took the production on tour to mm. the Netherlands and, uh, and adjacent areas of Europe later on after the Glyndebourne premiere. Um, and it's a prop that was used during the sewing scene. Obviously, there are various female characters who are sitting there sewing. They've got to have a piece of cloth to sew with. And initially, apparently, they were simply tacking um, random stitches into this bit of cloth because, you know, you're there acting, but at the same time keeping an eye on the conductor all the time and making sure that, you know, you, you come in uh, on, uh, in the exact point. But apparently, this, this is Nancy Evans' account of it, as the production went on and they became more and more familiar with it, they started getting cocky and they realised that they could actually start sewing names into this. And so the cloth has the names of, uh, you know, it's got Kathleen Ferrier as CAF, K-A-F-F, for example. It's got, you know, it's got pretty much the names of all of the cast they've managed to put in there by the end of the run. I think, if I remember rightly, they've actually got Benjamin written in full, which, you know, was presumably something you'd do on the penultimate night of the tour when you were really, really confident. 
Uh, it's pretty fragile now and we treat it with considerable respect, but uh, we recently displayed it in an exhibition and somebody um, who visited the exhibition said, oh yes, I remember Nancy Evans doing a talk about this in the Jubilee Hall. She just turned up with it stuffed into her handbag and then brought it out and you, know, you, you, you wince when you think about it because now it lives in a plant chest swathed in tissue paper. But it's a lovely item and I think it, it's, it's the thing that brings together those two worlds of out on the stage with the, the, you know, the group of friends having a laugh behind the scenes. And the, the choice of librettist is, is an interesting one. Mm. It's the one thing in terms of its critical reception, even now, that people yeah. say, oh, the, the music's marvellous, the librettist's not marvellous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it was written by, by Ronald Duncan, who uh, Britain had worked with in a number of, of yeah. uh, staged works mm. before, not operas, but plays yeah. and incidental music for him. Um, and the, the journey from its original conception and then the changes that Britain asked him to make are quite telling, mm -hmm. I find. I mean, I certainly i have seen in earlier drafts mm -hmm. that Ronald Duncan's view of the sexual assault scene, the rape central rape mm -hmm. scene, is far more of a, a seduction. Mm -hmm. It is far more that Lucretia is actually uh, encouraging him and that the, there's other elements of the libretto that are far more salacious. Mm -hmm. And it does seem as if Britain asked for those to be removed mm -hmm. yeah. and it became absolutely an assault yeah. um, with, with her repeated no's and his uh, insistence um and i so i do find that i do find that quite telling mm -hmm. in that duncan i think was trying to engineer it in a, in a very different way than this mm -hmm. rather pure yeah. in some yeah. senses story that britain actually ended up with yes and and it ends up, of course, being even purer in that the Lord Chamberlain wants cuts made to the, to the the first version of the libretto. There's a reference yes. to Lucretia putting her her hand on his unsheathed sword, which uh, Lord Chamberlain reckons is just a little bit short of the obscenities in Lady Chatterley. And frankly, you've got to have a fairly filthy mind to <laughs> to see that, I think. Um, but yes, the, the, there's definitely Duncan pushing to make it um, a question of, you know. Did, did she want this? Um, and Britain taking that out, where it, be it becomes more of a violation, uh, well, more, more of an unambiguous violation, let's say, because it is, it is always a violation, but it is, it, Britain makes the, the subject clearer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I mean, that's appropriate in, in all sorts of ways. I think it, it fits with Britain. And um, it is noticeable that Britain doesn't really do... Um, active sexual passion. Sex tends to be for Britain something that comes and disrupts stuff and I think that's probably something to do with his um, his being a gay man born at the time that he is when discovering your sexuality means discovering that you are in trouble, that there is, there is going to be um, the worry about criminal prosecution that later on in your life. Are you going to have to choose between fulfilment of your emotional nature or you know staying out of prison? Um, it's hard to be sex positive if you if you're a gay man at that time. Auden managed it, of course, but then Auden is not Britain. Britain is a much more sort of um, introverted and repressed individual. Um, so there's 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 that element of Britain wanting to make it purer. I think it's it's also quite telling that um, here we have a tussle between composer and librettist, and Britain wins in a way that he was, would not have won earlier on when Auden is his librettist. And we've got here, actually, the, the typescript of Britain's preface to the libretto of The Rape of Lucretia. I, mean, I won't read the whole thing, but there's, um, there's a very, very uh, telling bit in the middle of it. And I think this is, there is a, a W.H. Auden-shaped elephant in the room here. Um, where, where are we? Um, yes, opera composers have a reputation of ruthless disregard of poetic values, in some cases rightly. And all they need is a hack writer to bully, and serious poets won't stand for that. Now, I don't know what Ronald Duncan thought when he read that, but uh, it's fairly clear that, you know, basically your job, Ronald Duncan, is to come up with the material and I will then shape it because I f now am the composer who is in charge. Mm. And I think that, that was the power dynamic um, that was at fault, really, when, in Britain's work with Auden. He was working with somebody who was older than him and had been a mentor. Now... Again, coming back to that point of the team coming together, not only is the team coming together, but the team is coming together with Britain as the, very definitely the manager. He is the person who will put the vision together and uh, it is his say-so ultimately about whether something takes place or not. And Sorry, Ronald Duncan, you know, 
I, Britain, have got my vision for this and those bits are coming out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think to the opera's improvement, yeah, I have to say, yeah. th those early yes. drafts are quite disconcerting. Yes, um, yes. To, to read. Yeah. Um, and and it, would be, it would have been difficult, I think, to, I mean, it, it simply wouldn't have fitted with the look and feel of the, the production. The, 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 the stylization doesn't, it doesn't work, I think, with two people with, with living sexual passion in them. You know, you can, you can cope with Tarquinius, mm. but you know, he needs to be the lone disruptor of this, this sort of look, I think. Certainly, and I think that you find that in the music and that he, he there's this delineated male space mm. at the first scene yeah. and then a very female space yeah. and then Tarquinius bangs on the door yeah. and demands to be allowed yeah. in yeah. and that's when it all goes wrong. Yeah. So I think that that, yeah, you're, that, that yeah. means that, that that works dramatically. Yeah. I'm just going to talk through some aspects of the music drama of The Rape of Lucretia and specifically the separation of male groups and female groups and then where they clash violently at the centre of it all and then the implications. Um, as we've talked about in the first half, it's hard to know how conscious any of this was on the part of Britain's construction, but there are certainly some things that we can tease out that lend a, a, a dimension to the conversation that we've already had. It opens in this very strident way in C minor, and we'll come back to why that's important. And then begins with the male chorus. Um, the first dramatized scene, so the chorus then looks back on this drama playing out several centuries before. The first scene is, is Calatinus uh, and his colleagues, including Tarquinius, who are at war and they're at camp, in camp and they're drunk and they're having a kind of laddish conversation about their wives and who is the most chaste and who is the least chaste. And Calatinus has the most chaste wife and that is Lucretia. And then they, it becomes sort of increasingly bawdy. Their music starts in a sort of woozy, chromatic kind of drunken way with a harp representing a sort of um, um, insects. It's very hot. Um, and as I say, they've been, they've been drinking and the whole thing is very sort of woozy. Um, and as they talk about Lucretia, this, this motif, this musical motif appears around her name, which is this in this sort of five time. And that figure, that rather sinuous figure, becomes associated with Lucretia's name all the way through. Um, the female music, by contrast, uh, which is generally introduced and narrated by the female chorus, whereas the male chorus introduces the men's music, um, is the content of the second scene. And it is a very, very different character, instrumentally different. It's very high-lying, very lyrical, very beautiful. Um, not remotely drunken at all. And the three women in this scene are talking about uh, waiting. They're waiting, they're spinning, and Lucretia is longing for her husband. He's been away for a long time. Uh, and they just are talking about just their lives away from their menfolk. And it is a, this very beautiful female chorus, these very beautiful female lines of this section. <laughs> of the beautiful music in this opera is associated with uh, the female chorus and with Lucretia, these gorgeous melodic lines that Britain writes that are then so horribly attacked later on. The women's conversation is disrupted at the arrival of Tarquinius, who, who bangs on the door and intrudes into this female space. And they don't know quite why he's here. They don't know what he's come for. Um, but they all... Um, eventually have a conversation and then bid each other a very elaborate good night as he's given a bed for the night. Uh, and this is in C minor and is sung over this rather lovely series of chords. And it's a constant good night and then the whole scene ends as they all disappear. This low C. Um, the significance of the music in C major is that that's the music that's largely associated with Lucretia, C major, C minor. Uh, 
um, at the beginning of Act Two, she's sung a lullaby by the female chorus. And then when Tarquinius arrives, he sings in E, and E is his key. That's the key of disruption. Uh, and he is intruding into this sort of C major space with his E major. Um, so this is, this is the music of the lullaby. I mentioned how beautiful the music always is, and this is one of Britain's loveliest tunes. <laughs> And Lucretia is, is sleeping. And then when Tarquinius appears and is about to enter her room, he sings what in any other circumstance would be an absolutely gorgeous uh, love song, uh, uh, but isn't. It's sort of framed like that, but we all know that it, this is not going to be how it, how it works out. <laughs> goes on in this sort of beautiful romantic vein but then what happens is that he attacks her um, and the build-up to the assault is uh, brutal in and of itself the actual assault doesn't isn't shown um, on stage but the build-up is violent enough as I mentioned earlier with these repeated no uh, words from Lucretia um, and it ends with this motive associated with her name that Tarquinius has been so sort of lecherous about in the first scene um, which just is repeated over and over again as he attacks her. The next morning, Lucretia is, is undone by this uh, and ultimately she can't live with what has happened to her and she commits suicide. Before that, she sings a kind of lament to what has happened to her life, which she now sees as over. And it is in, back in her key of C minor, This repeated sort of funeral march type um, figure underneath her vocal line. Um, and after she has died, there is a, again, a sort of funeral march to her memory in E, uh, which is in Tarquinius's key. So that's the sort of acknowledgement of what has, has happened to her, sung by her husband, who has, who has appeared by this stage. Um, and ultimately then, but the opera resolves and ends in C. So it is kind of reclaimed by Lucretia's music at the end. So despite what um, may or may not have been their intentions in writing this opera and the kind of acknowledgement of the devastation that it causes the female, the female figure in this opera, there is a kind of musical reclamation at the end that it is her story, that it is actually the damage was done to her uh, throughout, but that her music at least survives at the end. And the subject of the women being asked in a way to make a sacrifice for the greater good, to resolve, to bring peace, is something that we'll be talking about in the next section. This is the final part of the final podcast in this series on the representation of sexual violence on the operatic stage. And for this session, I am joined by Professor Maria Wyck, uh, who is a professor of Latin at University College London and with a particular interest in the representation of gender and sexuality in the ancient world and the reception of that world uh, from a modern perspective. I'm just going to introduce Oliver Mears, who's directed many operas and many Britain operas, and is about to direct the forthcoming production of Rape of Lucretia. Um, Oliver, tell us about your background with this opera. I've always been very intrigued by Britain from the point of view of a stage director. He's a gift because he wrote with an instinct for theatre and for drama and for character. That means it's very enjoyable to dig into these scores and try and find uh, solutions to each theatrical moment and he's also a very interesting composer from the point of view of how um, codified or evasive his musical language is in contrast to many of the great opera composers who let's say wear their heart on their sleeves he is the opposite and um, 
a lot of what he writes is more about what he doesn't say than what he does say. So to excavate his work, so to speak, um, is to encounter the challenge of how you make the unsaid present on stage um, and as effectively as possible. And that's um, it's a really interesting challenge. And so with Lucretia in particular, what are the additional challenges that that opera brings? Well, obviously, the subject matter is um, deeply traumatic. And I think that, therefore, as a practitioner, you have an extra responsibility to approach the work in a particular way, and, in, 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 and especially in a responsible way. Um, because, um, just very sadly, this is a... Um, a crime which is committed more often than people think. It's a crime which very often goes unpunished. Um, it's a crime which afflicts every single society, including our own. And opera is nothing unless it engages with reality. But as a stage director, you have to make that piece aware of the um, trauma that people have experienced and the fact that when you are staging it, you need to be conscious of how the performers feel when you make it, um, creating an environment that is supportive in that sense and representing something in a responsible and not in a sensationalist way. So it is that does pose very particular challenges, interesting challenges, but um, uh, very significant ones. Do, do you think that that's something that directors such as yourself are considering more now than they might have done certainly perhaps when this opera was first staged in 1946, but also in the intervening, intervening decades, do you think that that awareness has grown in recent years about that responsibility? I think it has, and I think that's all to the good. And um, we all know the reasons why. And I think the fact that, for example, the role of the intimacy coordinator, which is something that we uh, really started this year at the Royal Opera House with um, Katie Mitchell's production of Theodora, it felt like a huge step forward that people were actually thinking how would female practitioners feel about the representation of sexual violence in a rehearsal room? Because I don't think they'd ever really been asked that question before. Um, how do you feel having to portray this character who is experiencing this? Um, and how does that impact on your ability to create that role and to be a performer who feels that they are being taken care of? And that feels like progress. And um, having an intimacy coordinator on the rape of Lucretia felt very important to us, having a, a, a practitioner, a well-being a practitioner who the cast could access if they wanted to, as well as having a fight director and, and a movement director. All of these things feel very positive, as does the fact that there is a really strong sense of um, female uh, um, agency, female voice in this project in terms of the balance of the creative team, and that felt very important too. Fantastic. Uh, that's really good to... to hear that I mean we, we, we've been aware in this podcast series that that is being taken care of but it's it, um yeah it, it's it's such an encouraging development um but Maria we're going back if we can go back many centuries just now to perhaps when people wouldn't have thought about such things um I'm really interested to to hear about from your perspective the how the myth of Lucretia came about in the first place and the, the story of the rape. Well, it's very interesting thinking about that in relation to watching um, and listening to a production of the, of the uh, Britain Opera because one of the very striking things in contrast, if you go back to the ancient world, if you don't look through the eyes of Christ as um, the opera invites us to, but, but think about what was the story doing in the ancient context, um, it had a much, much more political significance in a way that actually is probably quite disturbing to us now because in its original narration, in its most extensive narration in antiquity was in a history um, that Livy had written about uh, the beginnings of Rome. And the beginnings of Rome are full of incidents of rape that cause particular important political moments. So the, the rape of Lucretia has a really strong figurative role to play, and it does it, it, it has that, 
because of a very different understanding of the position of women in Roman society. So the way we understand how this narrative works is that, um, that what Tarquinius does is representative, characteristic of what tyrants do. It's symbolic of his um, mistreatment of the Roman people. And the reason that, that, that the, the, the story of her rape can be treated in that way is because in Roman society, women were the property of their husbands. And that was how she perceived herself also in the narrative. So Tarquinius is violating um, the property of, her, of Lucretia's husband. And that is one of the reasons why he wants her consent, however brutally uh, achieved by saying, I will kill you if you don't. And the reason he wants her consent is because it's a greater violation if the woman has seemingly consented than if it was entirely through physical force, even though he's, hold, you know, he's clearly holding a dagger at the time. So the idea is that um, he has violated a piece of property. This is symbolic of the treatment of Roman society. Therefore, the really important part of the narrative in the ancient world is the moment when Lucretia gathers together her father, her husband, uh, Junius, uh, Lucius Brutus is there, and she says to them, you must take revenge for this, kills herself with a, with a sword with which she has been threatened, but then expects them to do something about the rapist. But the rapist is also the son of the king. So the idea is that her act initiates a revolution and initiates a change from monarchy to republicanism. And you can see that even uh, in, say, 19th century, um, 18th century paintings of the rape of Lucretia concentrate on the moment when Brutus takes the oath in the forum over the corpse of Lucretia to free the Roman people from oppression. That's the political perspective. And, but the opera is not really very interested in that as I, as I see it. It's just for a very small moment at the end when, mm. um, when Junior says, um, oh, I, ca I, I can take power now. Yeah. But in fact, it's not an I in the Roman world. It's a change to the Republic, so it's a force for good. So she actually has a lot of agency in, in the story in the ancient world, ironically. I mean, even though it's about politics, She's the one who makes the decision. She calls the shot. She tells them that they need to make this political change. I think what's also extraordinary is the events that we're seeing in Iran at the moment and the way in which this huge political turbulence um, in a society which certainly is problematic from the gender point of view, I think it's an understatement to say. Um, and that came from one particular act of violence against a woman. And what that says about the timelessness of this particular story is very fascinating, yes. I think. I think the difference, though, is that nowadays we understand that um, acts of rape are undertaken by uh, in warfare, which is mm. the condition in which the, the story of Lucretia takes place, because the men are soldiers. So, you know, we understand that, that rape happens in these conditions, that it's part of a process of humiliating and degrading the mm. people that you are uh, taking over, but I think the difference is that in the ancient world, this would be seen as as sort of destroying their property, whereas mm. now we would see it as attacking individuals, and we wouldn't sort of discriminate between, say, rape and the torture of a soldier. I mean, we'd we would see those as 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 acts of terror, you know, in the same sort of way, and of, often ethnically based as well. I mean, it's it's something which is hinted at, and it, and is overt in the opera as well that there, there is a a racial difference between the Etruscans, Tarquinius, and the Romans, Lucretia and Collatinus on the other side, and the fact that, as you say, sexual violence is a means to humiliate uh, someone of a different ethnicity is, again, very current, of course. And the, the property aspect is in the, the uh, Lucretia story up, up to a point. I mean, it, the, they're comparing wives, basically, at the first scene, mm. aren't they? Yes. And then, who, and, then, and then it becomes a kind of um, horrible bet, almost, that, that, that this takes place. Um, Ollie, the, the opera is framed several centuries, so it's, it's kind of, it's at a double remove, mm. the actual Lucretia story, so it's got this intervening frame of the Christian female and male chorus. What 
that is always seen as one of the other challenges yeah. of Lucretia's. What do you do with that? Yes. And how, how does that sit? And, you know, there's, there's people have seen it done in different ways. What, how, how did you go about, in a way, folding that into your... Well, I don't want to give away too much no, no, uh, before, the, before the show opens, <laughs> but um, you're absolutely right to identify the, the Christianity mm. and the role of the male and female chorus, actually, in general, as, um, and one of the, as one of the kind of dramaturgical problems of the piece. Um, because they feel very emotionally detached or disengaged. And when you're making opera, you want the audience to experience uh, the utmost levels of emotion, um, because that's why people go to the opera. So if there's any level of detachment or alienation on, say, on stage in the presentation, that is a, that's a problem for a, for a stage director. So you have to think about, well, what are those people doing there? Um, why are they um, espousing this incredibly intense... Um, Christianity, given that Britain himself was not particularly religious, um, and um, I don't think even the, the, the original Abrestis was particularly religious. So why is it there um, theatrically? Mm. Um, why is it there emotionally? And um, for me, that was very much the way in to find a way that made these characters more human and the, their predicament more engaging and their religion more understandable um, from the personal point of view was very much the way in, 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 in finding a solution to that problem. Because it's very strange that you have these people who are um, haranguing the audience um, yeah. about, <laughs> um, about the Virgin Mary and, and Christ, and, and it's all very, very strange. And, and, um, uh, and hopefully we found a way through that. Yeah. Because there's a really interesting issue about that layering of Christianity, that sense that, that the opera is inviting you to see through the eyes of Christ mm. and to see... The, to see Christ as the sort of solution to what seems to be a terrible situation and a, a suffering that has, you know, no redemption. Mm. Christ provides the redemption. What's really interesting about that is in, in the ancient world, um, St. Augustine uh, intervenes in this controversy because the Lucretia story is very powerful for the way it engages with issues about social stigma, the, the ethics of suicide, you know, why does she feel she needs to kill herself um, if she's been raped. And um, St. Augustine disturbingly says, you know, he really doesn't stand, understand this ancient story because why do they praise her if she committed adultery? And if she didn't commit adultery, why did she kill herself? It doesn't make any sense. His solution is to suppose that either she wanted this to happen, which is extremely disturbing, um, or that she was seeking a kind of glory in death, you know, as a kind of, you know, pagan martyr, which she didn't care for either. So either way, she doesn't come out of it very well. So it's a bit ironic in a way that, that this Christian layering that the opera has seems to be a way of trying to understand and give purpose to the story. I mean, the story was originally meant to be exemplary, exemplary of... Um, the steps one takes towards uh, a more consensual politics, the steps, um, an understanding of the really difficult position of women in ancient society. And, and you could even read the, the ancient narratives in terms of, of Lucretia as a symbol of, you know, resistance. You know, um, um, you know she, she, is, she expresses her distress in the ancient world, as, as indeed she does in the opera, she says no, she resists, and her death in, in the ancient context, you could see as the, the only route to make a difference, the only route to get something to happen. And, and that, I think, can, can come out very well in the opera because the ancient story is very performative. You know, you're mentioning that Britain was very good at understanding performance, and in the, in the ancient narrative, it's already very performative. It's all about arriving in this sort of dramatic way at night, coming and looking in at her, at, uh, at then the, the performance of her suicide in front of, the, of mm -hmm. the family. It's all about looking and about how it's staged. Yes. And it's interesting, your reflections on the political meaning that various writers or eras have subscribed to the story. And, again, just coming at it from the point of view of staging it, what for me felt like the absolute priority was not necessarily the um, the political dimension, which no. is mentioned, but um, it is not um, central, I think, to, to the opera. Um, and more in relation to why does this person do what she does? 
And Lucretia, Lucretia doesn't necessarily think politically at all. I think that this is to someone who's experienced um, the most traumatic event that anyone could possibly imagine. And she can't cope with that anymore. And so she, she doesn't necessarily subscribe political meaning to what she does, even if subsequent, probably largely male, writers, theor- theoreticians um, do. And I think that's also quite interesting, the way in which um, Lucretia uh, is um, a useful body, um, both in life and subsequently, is a theme that certainly we wanted to draw out in this particular production, in the, in the fact that she is someone who is raised onto a pedestal for political reasons. Um, the fact that she has this, um, this chastity um, is is a reason why her husband, Calatinus, has high status in this, in this society. The fact that she is then... Um, uh, she commits suicide and, and is a useful body for Junius mm-hmm. Brutus um, to take political control um, is a sign the extent to which she has kind of, in a way, quite... She has agency over her own body because she kills herself, but she has... Um, uh, her body is also used in a way which is quite demeaning to her because it's... Um, uh, is that the is that the use of men rather than uh, for her own use? I think that's I think that's yeah. absolutely right. Um, I th- I think you know one of the sort of hopes with the Lucretia story is that that even in the in the ancient narratives there's this this core of reflection on her circumstance where from her point of view this isn't as you say about politics. This is about her body mm. and what has happened to her and. In the ancient context, it's also about reputation. Reputation mm. is very important. So she has to kill herself in, in the ancient context because um, there's a risk to reputation. There's a possibility people might use her as an example for adultery. That's mm-hmm. what she's mm-hmm. afraid of. Um, but I think there's nonetheless, there, there is enough dwelling on what must, what must it be like you know, as a woman in these in these sorts of situations, mm. and there's enough of that of her reflecting on the horror of what's happened and what her, you know, the the the, the awful options that she has, the limited options that she has available. There's enough of that to have then filtered through this long tradition. Mm. And I think one of the things that then makes Lucretia an interesting person to represent and that Britain might have been interested in her for those sorts of reasons it is partly because there have been so many earlier versions versions that are interested in her um, the sexual politics in the position of women in in the difficulties women have in a in a man's world and and to some extent that comes out I think even in the structure of the opera as it is now mm. um, but it is it is quite troubling I think because I was very struck when I was watching um, a version of it the other day that there is this interlude, for example, an interlude between the decision by Tarquinius to come to the house and his arrival, Mm. where the male chorus is singing about his journey. Mm. And it's a very hyper-masculine description of him on his journey, full of what seem to be sort of sexual euphemisms. And... I, mean, I suppose in a way that sort of is an opportunity to heighten and disturb the audience in terms of knowing the horror that is to come. But it's it's quite difficult. And you kind of wanted the female chorus. Hmm. I don't know, if it was a different time and a different world, you want the female chorus to sort of, you know... Critique. <laughs> say, yeah. Yeah, to, to offer the critique. And I thought originally that that's what I was going to see, that the female chorus would say, hold it there, there's another way of thinking mm. about this. But I, I'm not sure that really happens. Yes, and um, and again, it's a, it's a very delicate balance because you want to represent the truth of that particular moment um, and uh, be very aware that there should not be any kind of celebratory aspect to those moments. And um, and I think that in our interpretation, there is a lot more ambivalence in the way that the male chorus sings that, despite the text. Um, and certainly one of the themes in in this production is, uh, you know, what, what's, what would be described these days as toxic masculinity and the various forms that that takes. Mm. Um, particularly in the context of conflict and war, when uh, human beings are brutalised and, and, and men as much as women. And that certainly accounts for a lot of their behaviour in this piece. Um, the fact that this is taking place in a, in in a conflict time. situation mm. is, 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 is fundamental. Yeah. 
So, sorry, it's just, just on that um, male-female split. I mean, it, of all Britain's operas, it's the most groups of men over here, groups of women over here. Mm -hmm. And then there's this brutal collision of a man entering this, this woman's world. And it seems that, I mean, but, that Britain has written some interesting female characters, but he t tends to perhaps think about them a little bit more uh, symbolically rather than dramatically. He's more invested psychologically, I would say, in male characters. Mm. Um, and, the, and as you say, the female chorus then doesn't somehow seem have to have so much to do. She sort of sings a lullaby. But there is a kind of camaraderie between the female chorus and the women and the male chorus and the, the men. Yes. They, they belong to, to those mm. sides of it, which is an odd... It's odd dramatically in a way because it's like they step into the drama and take sides mm. in some yeah. ways. It, it, that's how. It but seems that to be works presented. quite well mm. um, in terms of the significance of the story because one of the powerful elements of it is the sense of um, the place of sexual antagonism in the world, mm. the, the division mm. between yeah. the genders. And of course, because it's set in the ancient world, that division is very is much greater than it, it would be in the modern world. So you know, you have the world of the soldiers, the, the soldiers out. Um, on the battlefields, the, the being at the barracks, deciding to come to this protected inner sanctum, you know, the, the Roman house. Um, in, in the Roman world, the ideal um, occupation of a Roman woman is, is to spin wool. And so there's this whole um, focus, you know, on the creating of garments for the household. That's what women were supposed mm. to do. So in a way, the, the kind of understanding that we might now have of 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 oppositions and hostilities between sexes is is profoundly brought out by this story mm. and and perform and, and very performative in the way it's being constructed in 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 the opera's narrative and i think that's the tragedy that britain identifies for the male and the female characters is that they are stuck in their mm. very particular gendered roles this is a society whether it's uh, an opera that you set in the original roman era um or whether you create an almost alternative reality where um men have very much control over the bodies of, of women and the way in which they live their lives. Um, it's not regarded by Britain as a particularly good thing. In fact, I think it's regarded as deeply problematic, the fact that women have their roles, um, which, as you said, is about mm -hmm. sewing and um, dealing with um, textiles, uh, and the men whose business is, is war. And, and neither of them are celebrated. And it's the fact that they are so different and um, they are so gendered which is the cause of the tragedy in many ways um, and the fact that there isn't an ability for the men and the women to connect deeply, intimately that we see on stage very often anyway in this piece is the, uh, in some ways the root cause of why what happens happens yeah. I think and It just suddenly struck me that perhaps 1946 is a significant time to have originally compose the material and staged it because um, what you see are, ro are, are soldiers returning to the domestic exactly. space yes. and that, that, that is perennially an issue about how having had to perform your masculinity in a very different way in a very different context mm. how do you re-enter a social world and so you can see that might be an element of his of his interest Absolutely. in the material and we were, we were talking about this earlier the role of what Britain had experienced as a human being mm. in 1945, when, of course, we've had the revelations about the Holocaust, we've had the cataclysmic defeat of Germany um, in the first part of 1945, we've had the dropping of the atom bombs. Um, I mean, th these, are, these are experiences which no one had ever thought they, would, they would, could dream of before they did happen in 1945. And certainly a very useful way in for me was reading this um, book called A Woman in Berlin, which is the diary, the anonymous diary written by a journalist in Berlin, um, which he started writing it just before the Russians arrived. And, of course, it's well known that the Red Army raped around two million women, um, German women, um, at that time, and she herself was the victim of, of multiple rapes. And the way in which she dealt with that and found a means to carry on, it's very, very moving, very powerful. Um, but also the way in which the, the men themselves... The soldiers had been completely brutalised by what they had experienced when the Germans invaded Russia and um, the way in which they had obviously become traumatised themselves is, um, is a real, for me, um, way through the piece or a way into the piece to understand that what Britain was writing 
it, well, he wasn't really writing about um, war in in, um, in in ancient Rome. He was writing about the war that had just happened, um, and and how it had changed people, how it had traumatized people, and how it inflicted so much suffering mm. on people that he knew as well. But I think that's what the Roman story is good for: is mm. that it can be retold and yeah. adjusted and reshaped. Um, and sometimes even challenged in in different periods to to uh, to speak to current situations. And because the Roman world has its own extremes, it it then offers an audience mm. a really extreme version of the issues that they're having to confront in in sort of the present day world. And I think the the only sort of big difference now is if we wanted something more hopeful, we might not look through the eyes of Christ. We might look more to different opportunities Lucretia might have for herself in, in, in the plot line. Um, but you can understand why he, he didn't see that as a possibility in the, in the 1940s. Yes. Um, but I think that's why performance becomes really interesting because then you, you can, you know, with performance, as in modern restagings of Greek tragedy, you, you can, you know, with Antigone, for example, you can dress um, people in modern-day clothes and you see this issue of... Um, a kind of struggle between family and state replayed in very different social contexts, but in a yeah. very extreme way and very telling for the audience to see it. Well, opera, of course, as we know, is, uh, has its origins in Greek tragedy, mm. and um, the fact that the rape of Lucretia is, it is effectively, it's a Greek tragedy or Roman tragedy, whatever you want to call it. And um, what does that mean? Well, it means that its concerns are timeless, for want of a better word. And it's... Um, Preoccupation with the intersection between the domestic and the societal. Uh, I mean, they're at the core. They're at the root cause of so many Greek tragedies, and um, the role of uh, the role of war, the role of um, the role of women, the role of men. It's 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 all in all of these great great works, um, and means that they've survived to this day. And I think that the story of the rape of Lucretia is no different. 